Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is all about leadership. And we have a special guest today, Sydney Brown. Sydney is into hmm, leadership. She's into creativity, and she runs a shoe company, the likes of which you have never, ever heard before, I'm sure. Welcome to the show, Sydney. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm yeah. so delighted to know you, meet you, and have you, have you here with us today. So let's talk about uh, this fabulous brand you're developing, uh, Sydney Brown, out of New York, L.A., and Porto. Exactly. Porto, Portugal, yes. Mm -hmm. Talk about it, will you? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I started this company about nine years ago, and um, it had been a response to there being no vegan sustainable shoes on the market. And so, um, yeah, about nine years ago, I, I had a New Year's resolution to stop buying leather. And I had always felt so conflicted about leather. Um, and I had been a vegetarian for so many years. And so, um, so I, I made this a New Year's resolution. Um, and within about a week of that, I had a big event in L.A. and I needed shoes. And I realized that there were no sustainable luxury options on the market. And there was this huge hole in the market. Um, and so I then took that upon myself to... Uh, to uh, solve. And so um, I found this amazing shoemaker in LA. And so I apprenticed with him for about a year. Um, and I learned the craft from pattern making all the way through lasting, which is putting it, uh, shaping it to the form. And so, um, yeah, so it began that way. And I started making bespoke shoes for weddings and for events. Um, and then I, I uh, moved forward and, and started my own brand. Um, and with the very first collection, we were invited to show in Paris. And so then it went from there. So it's been quite a journey. I've seen photographs of your shoes. Uh... Mm. And they're really beautiful. I, I didn't see anything for men. Are you doing men also? Uh, we're doing sneakers for men, and we have a few styles that are, are unisex. So yeah, I yeah. want that. I want that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you look great. Okay, so you have yeah. so many creative points. You know, I looked through your what's called pitch book, mm -hmm. um, and it is so it knocked my socks off. Mm. It even knocked my shoes off. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. indeed, we're calling we're calling this show uh, these. Boots are made for business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or if the shoes fit, wear them. Great, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can use that. Anyway, what's different about this? Well, you're, you're appealing to millennials and, and, and Generation Z. Exactly. You're appealing to a, a whole new world of, of consumers. Tell us about how you, how you have found them and how you reach them. Yeah, well, um, well, I think that the biggest thing um, when we were uh, switching from or we were not using leather and so we had to find so many alternatives. Um, and so the, the plastic situation is so horrific. And so um, we, uh, we ended up just exploring the materials. And so this has been the main kind of breadth of my work. And so um, we, we started to develop then and, and kind of explore uh, organic fibers and then also recycled materials. Um, and uh, right now, the, the plastic pollution situation is so horrific, and um, the, the marine plastic is just this unbelievable problem, and especially here in Hawaii, we're, we're feeling this so dramatically. And so um, right now, um, Americans are, are using about 2 million bottles, like plastic bottles, every five minutes. And so it's just unbelievable, this, this plastic crisis that we have. And uh, plastic is a design failure. There's no way of getting rid of it. Um, and this is what's so challenging. And so uh, we're working now with a lot of NGOs and different government organizations to collect the plastic um, and then clean it, break it down, so shred it, um, and then melt it, and then develop polyester fibers, um, and then to weave those and create materials for those. So we're, so we're working on upcycling. Um, and so, but this is just one of the, the pieces um, the, I think it, you know, initially people had used leather for shoes, um, and then the synthetics and the, the plastics then began to develop. And the next stage will, will really be the, the biomaterials, and I'll speak about that more, more in a second. Um, but I think everyone now is feeling this, this crisis in terms of, of the marine plastic and in terms of just the, 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 the climate crisis in general. Um, and so um, I'm really now working on, you know, solving this and, and really following the supply chain. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that fashion is the, the second largest polluter globally this outside of big oil and after big oil. And so um, it's this incredible problem that we have. Um, and so, um, yeah, so there, there's so much work that can be done and that needs to be done. So, um, so one example, I've, I've just now uh, created the first uh, biodegradable stiletto. Um, and so generally, uh, shoes are made with 
uh, molded plastic, and so and then they're covered with, or, or the heels, excuse me, are made with molded plastic, um, and then they're covered with the upper material. Um, and so um, I've now created a, a, a stiletto uh, that has the um, wood, it's kind of wood pulp, um, and then a resin, and then a steel rod down the middle for stability. Um, and so this has been so exciting. And Natalie Portman actually wore our very first prototype on Saturday Night Live, which was so exciting. Um, and so I think the, the millennials and the Gen Zs are, you know, the Greta Thurbergs of our time are now, you know, moving forward and they realize that this is a crisis. And, um, you know, the, they've said now that by 2025, the coral will be dead. You know, the, the, world, the world's coral will be dead. Um, and so by 2030 or so, the oceans will be dead. And I think a lot of people don't understand that we're you know, getting most of our oxygen from the ocean. You know, 20% or so is from the trees and you know, the various rainforests. But 60 to 80% is from uh, the, the phytoplankton and the small marine you know, plants in the ocean. And so if we're losing this, then we're, we're really entering the sixth extinction. Um, and we will become the dinosaurs soon. And there's no way we're going to be able to get a billion people to Mars by 2040. You know, so um, I mean, this is an absolute emergency. And so um, I think millennials and Gen Zs are are so conscious of this, and they know that the world soon will be so much different. And so um, it's an emergency for everyone yeah, to step I hope forward. People realize it. You know, I, I can't help but think of Dustin Hoffman and The Graduate, um, mm. and uh, he's he's with his um, you know, the father of his uh, girlfriend, I guess. And uh, at a swimming pool in that movie, and uh, the father leans over to him and he says, young man, it's all about plastics. Yes, plastics. that's a very famous and, line. You know, at yeah. the time, this is what, this is supposed to be in the 60s, I guess, um, it's all about plastics meant that that was the modern high-tech approach to materials of, you know, of all kinds of products. Yeah. And in our lifetimes, or at least in my lifetime anyway, um, you know, all that has changed. And then you see, you see these incredible photographs of seabirds mm -hmm. uh, who have died from plastic who, mm -hmm. and all kinds of animals in the sea and, and elsewhere mm -hmm. who have died from plastic. And, and then we thought, well, not a good idea to have plastic and it's out of control. Um, yeah. And then finally you, because mm -hmm. you represent more, you know, than just, you know, shoes. You represent a whole idea which could carry over into so many other products uh, yeah. in, to reuse the plastic. Can you talk a little about how you do that? Don't get too technical with me. Mm -hmm. Just talk about how you reuse the plastics and take you know, a shoe or any object of plastic and make it into another shoe or some other object. Yeah, well, um, so for example, the plastic that we're using, yeah, is is ground down and then and melted, and then uh, fibers are created, and then and then woven into materials. Um, and so, um, but the the challenge is that this, you know, we're we're upcycling, but we're just continuing this cycle, and there's really no way of getting rid of it. Um, and so, the future, I, I think, of, of footwear and of, of materials in general are the biomaterials, and these are so interesting. And so, um, we've been working on on development of, for example, we just uh, developed a, a, a sole that's made out of rice husk, um, and that's so exciting. Um, and so, and then we're using pineapple fiber and fennel, um, and you know, apple and cacti and toxic algae blooms, and and so many different materials and. Um, with the biomaterials, um, it, it's so interesting because the, the biofabrication movement is mo moving so quickly. And for example, there, you know, the, the uh, biologists are programming E. coli, and then they're creating self-healing materials. Um, and then the, the thing that I'm most excited about is the biofabricated leather. Um, and so that's building collagen in a Petri dish, so actually growing the collagen. Um, and so you can grow it, you know, like you would an organ or, you know, an ear in medicine. And so they can actually grow it and they can embed properties like durability, breathability, color, pattern, you know, all of these things. Um, and then the ideal scenario would be to grow it in the actual pattern piece so that then there's no waste in cutting. Um, so, so this is extremely exciting and this will be the future for sure. Oh, yeah, so, definitely. Not only yeah. for shoes, but for so many other things. Yeah. But, you know, I wonder, though, let me ask you this question, you mm -hmm. know. I go out and buy a pair of leather shoes or, you know, even plastic shoes or cloth shoes. Let's mm -hmm. see, what am I wearing today? I'm wearing this kind of plastic, kind of looks like leather kind of shoes. Mm -hmm. Strong. Lasts me a while. Okay. Not too expensive. Yeah. Uh, how does that compare with the kind of shoes you're talking about? Are the kind of shoes you're talking about going to last longer? 
Are they going to have the same, you know, resilience to weather and wet and cold and all the other elements that shoes have to go through? Or, or are they going to fail sooner? Well, I mean, we've been so we've been working on this now for nine years, and you know, so far so good. Um, you know, it's also depending on on the the style of shoe and everything. So, um, but yeah, up until now, we've had about the same you know abrasion. We've been doing abrasion tests and things like that, and it's been about the same. So, um, yeah, so it's really exciting, and um, yeah, this is this is definitely the the step forward. So, what kind so. of reception have you had in the marketplace? I mean, I know what your market is, and mm -hmm. I know what. You know, we believe, I agree with you certainly, that the uh, millennials and the Generation Zs are going to be interested, hopefully, to, for their own survival in the next generation, yeah. uh, you know, in this kind of renewable product, this kind of uh, environment-friendly product. But have they responded to your uh, concept here in, in, in a business sense? Have they, have they floated your boat, so to speak? Well, yeah, it's so interesting. Um, nine years ago when I began this, uh, people thought that um, this was so niche and there would be no market for this. Um, and now it's, you know, I think it, because of the global, the, the, the climate crisis, um, the, the demand is just growing um, incredibly. And so um, I think people are, are uh, yearning for a connection back to nature. Um, and when people see, you know, the logo on my products, they realize that this is a symbol of change. Um, and so people, you know, are, are, are so ready for this. And so the reception has been incredible. Um, and it's, you know, we can't even keep things in stock. It's moving so quickly now. So, um, yeah, so it's really exciting. Well, let's talk so, about your factories. I'm fascinated with that, you know, because yes. it's not like people wake up one morning and say, hmm, I think I'll build a factory. You mm -hmm. have to have a lot of ideas and creativity. You have to have a market. You have to have capital to build a factory. So your first factory was in Los Angeles. But the demand outgrew the production because you couldn't meet you couldn't meet all the orders. So what happened in, in Los Angeles, and where did you go from there? Yeah, well, when I initially started the brand, we were working in Portugal and the UK, and because we hadn't really understood the materials and the constructions, the construction has to be so much different because we're not using leather, um, and so we had a lot of trial and error in the beginning. Um, and then because I had studied in LA and I, I knew the footwear community there, um, I decided to bring it back to Los Angeles and to build my own factory and my own staff. Um, and then we, we had about three years of, of heavy R&D and really just, you know, re-engineered the shoe. And so we completely followed the supply chain. So if there are about 15 components generally in a shoe, um, we would either find sustainable suppliers or if we didn't, if we couldn't and they didn't exist, um, then I just had to figure it out myself and, and partner with, you know, the experts in the industry. And so, uh, for example, we didn't have a, a proper vegan glue that worked with our materials. Um, and so I found the, the top adhesive scientists in, you know, from Italy, Portugal, the UK, America, from, from many places, um, and worked collaboratively with them. And after four years or so, we were able to perfect that. Um, so, but it was extremely challenging, and um, the financially, it was it, it was a terrible struggle. And so, I uh, to be as frugal as possible, I actually moved into the factory and I lived on the floor for the for those three years. Um, and I had no short shower or toilet, which was also um, extremely That's challenging. That's what I call so, dedication. So, um, but then, yeah, thank God the, the demand grew. Um, and then I was able to find an incredible factory in Portugal um, that was sustainably powered and it cut against technology. And so we were and able to take the whole package that we had developed and move it there and teach them and work with them. And so, um, yeah, so it's been quite a journey. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So uh, your shoes um, uh, don't have animal parts to them? Correct. They don't, yeah. uh, and they and they're vegan. Is it, does that mean that I can I can uh, eat the shoe at some point? Are they edible in some way? Well, I don't know how good they would taste, but ideally they would be able to biodegrade, and so this is what we're striving for. So, yeah. uh, and uh, the other the other thing I wanted to ask you about before the break, anyway, is uh, you have this fabulous program that really struck me. You know, in the software industry, mm -hmm. there was a time when you bought software. That was it. Um, now you go buy software and you subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. Like Adobe is a good example. You subscribe. Mm -hmm. And so it goes on and on and it becomes part of your intellectual life, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, to be an Adobe person. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing with these shoes, which I hadn't heard before. You take a shoe and you can return the shoe to Sidney Brown. And Sidney Brown will remake the shoe mm -hmm. uh, into a new shoe 
Tell mm -hmm. us how that works. Exactly. So, yeah, so at the end of the life cycle, um, so we're now uh, welcoming the shoes back and we give an incentive to the customer uh, to return the shoes back to us. Um, and then just like the ocean plastic, we, we, we take it and we grind it down and melt it. And uh, then 30% of that can be used uh, for a new sole um, that we can, we can put into the, the new sole material. Um, and then the 70% we can recycle. And so we're now um, the, to do more than 30% now, it may, it's a bit unstable, and so we're, we're trying to, to grow that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're welcoming all the shoes back so that there's no outside waste. <laughs> Not they've so. lost. Yeah. Perfectly efficient. Exactly. Okay, that's Cindy yeah. Brown. She, she yeah. runs a company called Cindy Brown LLC. She is all about leadership, and we're going to have a short break. We'll be right back. We'll talk, about, we'll talk about the market as it is going forward and the shops that she is going to build. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Keisha King, host of Crossroads in Learning on ThinkTech Hawaii. On Crossroads in Learning, our guest and I discuss all aspects of education here in Hawaii and throughout the country. You can join us for stimulating conversations to enrich, enliven, and educate. We are streamed live on ThinkTech bi-weekly at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Thanks so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Duration. I'm the host of Finding Our Future here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here every other Tuesday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. Here on this show, um, I cover issues around sustainability, um, you know, global issues that matter for young people for future generations, and other social justice issues. So please join us. It's live streamed on Think Tech Hawaii and also uploaded on YouTube. Right, we're back with Sydney Brown, a, a mistress of shoes, so to speak, um, in all in leadership. And uh, we want to talk about exactly what she's going to do going forward for a minute. And I saw in your in your uh, your book, your uh, pitch book, uh, mm -hmm. that you were going to build shops here and there. What's your plan? Yeah, well, over the next few years, uh, we're going to slowly be uh, rolling out. Uh, we'll, we'll have a flagship store in New York City. Um, and then to roll out from there. And um, before shoes, um, I had been a music promoter and I lived in Japan for many years. And in fact, your education was in music, wasn't it? Um, I, I had a minor in music, yes. So um, and I, I went music to Japan. Of shoes, yeah. yeah, I went to Japan to do a, a master's in sound design. And, um, and so uh, I was working with, I, I'm from Detroit originally, and so the, the techno and house music culture uh, is very strong. And so, um, so I began promoting shows in Japan, and I ended up uh, representing uh, labels and artists from all over the world um, at, at the end of my tenure there. Um, and so I have so many connections still with, with, the, with the music community. And so I wanted to provide a, a space uh, for the shoes and also for events and just to create kind of a communal space uh, where people could... Um, yeah, share ideas and and you know move the the vision forward, so to speak. So yeah, so we're hoping to roll these out within the next couple of years. Yeah, so these so, these are more than just ordinary retail stores. These are stores with an experience, right? Exactly. Consistent with your your whole mission uh, of uh, saving the planet, if you may. Yeah. Um, but but uh, I just wonder where where can I get them? I mean, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the natural question would be Amazon. Can I go to Amazon? Um, can the, I go to the, Amazon the, now? Will I go yeah. later? Uh, they're not on Amazon, but uh, on our website, and then we're in shops. We're in, I guess, over 100 shops now uh, in 13 countries, and so we're, we're all over the world. And Japan has been our largest market uh, since the beginning, and so, um, so that's been so wonderful. Well, let's so. talk about let's talk about design going forward. And uh, you mm -hmm. call, you you have a word called practique. What what is that? Um, well, uh, so we're, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're expanding the line and so, and we're, we're starting bags now. And so within the next few work, uh, weeks, we'll have bags launched. Um, and so that's really exciting. And we have a designer from Balenciaga who is, is handling all of the bag design. I'm, I'm doing shoes, but I, I need help and support with the bags. And so, uh, yeah, so we're thrilled with this and, and just to slowly be expanding the brand. So, yeah. what are the bags made of? And um, perhaps if I can't eat the shoes, I can eat the bags. Uh, what, um, what's in the bags? So, yeah, and so the bags we're using a lot of the marine uh, plastics, and so um, this is the the main ingredient uh, or the main uh, material, um, and then various linings and, and things like that. So, um, so they're not quite edible, edible, but uh, hopefully soon in the future. Well, you yeah. know, it's interesting. We live in an interesting time in human history when 
maybe we don't pay enough attention to the environment and don't pay mm -hmm. enough attention to climate change. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's going to be a price to pay for that. Yeah. But hopefully uh, businesses like yours can sort of smooth out the, the rough corners and uh, make life easier and make us feel, what did you call it, ethical footwear? Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. whole picture is ethical footwear. Yeah. yeah. Well, and hopefully, yeah, and, and we'll be, you know, continuing to expand. And um, I think one of the biggest challenges is that uh, when we, um, I mean, just in terms of sustainability in general, um, some brands say that they're, you know, 100% sustainable or something like that. Um, but, you know, what we considered sustainable five years ago is no longer so. And so it has to be a constant process of refinement. And, uh, and this is what is so, so challenging and what will keep pushing us forward. So. Sydney, there's really something special about the plastic. Can you talk about it? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges and what I face every day is how to get, how to not use it. And, you know, we're, we're bombarded with all the products, you know, that use plastic. And so um, I just made a bit of a little list here of the, the products that I'm using. Um, and so, for example, like shampoo, conditioner, deodorant, you know, we don't need to have these in plastic bottles. And so this is just a, a small example of the, the options that are available on the market. Um, but we need to stop using plastic, you know, full stop. And this is an absolute emergency now. So, um, so here are some, some great alternatives. Um, Let's so. talk about a price mm -hmm. point because, I mean, if I was watching yeah. this, uh, you know, either as a man or a woman, I would say to myself, well, this is very special, mm -hmm. um, but is this going to give me a price point that I can afford or is it going to be, you know, uh, too extravagant for me? Talk to me about price point now and in the future. Yeah, um, well, right now um, they range from about, I guess, about two fifty to four hundred dollars or so. Um, and I think the biggest uh, challenge in terms of marketing is people assume that if we're not using leather, that it should be less expensive. And um, and in fact, the the materials are, are so complex that they're um, it's it's more expensive, you know, often than leather. And so um, this is just a, a, a challenge with the education and, and something we're we're working on. So, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you talked about uh, shoes and handbags, but the, you know the, the biological process involved mm. could develop other other products, other clothing products, uh, other accessories. Yeah, um, and I, I suppose uh, you know that that would be a dream come true mm. because <coughs> excuse me, we have been waiting for biological clothes for a long time, mm -hmm. <coughs> and with your technique, you could do that, couldn't you? We could, and we'll see in terms of how we're going to expanding. But we have, yeah, we have a lot of exciting plans that, um, yeah, in the works. So, yeah. So um, you're you're going to get bigger, but to get bigger, you have to have capital. You have to approach the capital markets. Mm -hmm. um, how how does a company like yours do that? Um, and and how hard or soft is the capital market for somebody uh, in in the shoe business, especially in a sort of a cutting edge shoe business? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, the, the shoe business generally is so challenging, and I, I don't know what the exact statistic is, but something like 95% of shoe businesses fail within the first five years or, or something like that. So, so we've made it past that, um, that hurdle. Um, but uh, yeah, we, um, we've been actively fundraising since the beginning, and um, yeah, people I think now are so much more responsive than they had been a few years ago. Um, and so, yeah, so things are going very well. Well, so, when, these, when they yeah. see this show, Sydney, you know, you'll see what happens. Good. Uh, quite okay. amazing. Yeah. Now, let's talk about leadership. We can't, mm -hmm. we can't finish without talking about leadership. This is all about leadership, and mm -hmm. you are clearly the leader of this company. Yeah. But how do you do that? I, I noticed, for example, in looking through your book, mm -hmm. that a good percentage, if not most, of your critical staff um, and, you know, the the cadre around your company, they're all women, or most of them are women. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason? Is that just accidental? Uh, why do you do that? And how do you relate to them in order to be the leader mm -hmm. of a company like this? Well, um, I, it so happens that they, they were the most um, amazing candidates, and so that's why I hired them, and it wasn't specifically because they were women. How do you find um, them? Um, through networking and, yeah, just person-to-person -person connection. So... Um, but yeah, it's it's been really incredible, and um, I, you know, my 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 primary strength is the material development and, and the product side, and I don't have an MBA, and um, and I, I wish I, I did, but 
Um, so I'm now able to find women who, who are supporting me and, 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 and colleagues who are supporting me. And, you know, and so it's just been, it's been wonderful. So, well, how do, yeah. you, how do you unleash them? You know, you're the creative leader of the company, mm -hmm. but you want uh, all the staff under you to be creative also, uh, mm -hmm. and in a way consistent with your creativity, but you want to give them a certain amount of room. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do you, how do you manage them to do that? How do you um, incentivize them, encourage them to be creative, and to help you move the whole thing ahead, which, as you said, has to be moved all the time, always have to be moving forward. How do you create a staff that will resonate with that? Well, I think the, the biggest uh, point is that they, are, they believe so deeply in what we're doing. And so um, I don't have to do much, uh, luckily, in, in terms of that. Um, and they also realize that this is an absolute crisis and, and something needs to be done uh, you know, on a global scale in terms of the climate. Um, and so they're extremely, you know, self-motivated and, and working, working towards this. So, um, so I've been lucky in that I have this uh, incredible group of, of colleagues who are, are so motivated and, and so competent. So, mm. um, yeah, so that's been wonderful. So you're living in New York right now? I am. I'm in Brooklyn. So. <clears throat> in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I want you to know I love Brooklyn. I told you that before. Yes. <laughs> I'm from Queens. Uh, mm -hmm. In any event, uh, you know, what, what does the New York milieu mean to your creativity and your staff, I expect most of them are in New York. Mm -hmm. um, well, how do you, you know, engage with the city? How does the city engage with you? Why is why are you in New York as opposed to some other place? Well, I had been in Hawaii, and the uh, the time difference between Hawaii and Porto is about eleven hours, so that that was so challenging. Um, so New York or the East Coast was the closest I could get to to Portugal. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, just the energy of the city is incredible, and the music and the dance and um, I mean, just the, the culture is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, and so that, that's so energizing and so exciting to be, you know, around people who are, are moving so quickly. So, yeah. But you travel a lot, though, don't you, Sydney? I do. I'm trying to minimize it as much as possible, but I, I do. And my family is based here in Hawaii, and uh, we've been here for about 100 years now. And so, um, so this has been a very important base for me. You know, honestly, so, you don't look that yeah. old. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think it's great what you're doing, Sydney. I think it's a beautiful thing, and mm. I think you've achieved a leadership not only among your own company and staff and you know designer professionals, but mm. also you know in the world. And, and mm -hmm. your company is a statement of leadership, lest we forget. Mm. So uh, I want you to know that I really appreciate what you're doing, and I think a lot of people do and will. And I think you, uh, you're in a great spot to actually have an effect on the way people see the world around them. Great. So thank you for doing that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for showing up and being part of our Think Tech program. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, and I hope that you'll talk to me later when you get even more incredibly successful. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sydney. Brown. All right. Take care. Bye -bye.